Christian Parenting. We want what we want when we want it. If we want to love others, we have to do battle with selfishness. Join us as we talk about this today on Family Vision. Hi, my name is Ray Reno. Welcome to Family Vision with my parents, Dr. Rob and Amy Reno. Strengthening families through practical, encouraging, and real conversations. Family Vision is powered by the Christian Parenting Network. Hi, Rob Reno here with Visionary Family Ministries. We are continuing our summer series talking about love. Today, we're going to talk about how love is not selfish. The problem is, is we are selfish. We all struggle with self-centeredness, just wanting what we want when we want it. So we're going to dig into 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where God tells us, gives us this definition of what love is and what love isn't. And one of the things God says that if we want to love him and we want to love others, we've got to do battle with selfishness. A few weeks ago, Millie reminded me of how important definitions are. We use words, obviously, and it's really important that you know what words mean. This whole series, Love Is, it's a whole series about defining a word. And if you have the wrong definition for a word, it can get you into a lot of trouble. So a month ago, I'm picking up Millie from dance class, and we are in the car uh, in the, the parking lot, and she sees this sign on the side of the building. Violators will be prosecuted about breaking the parking rules or whatever. She said, Dad, is that really true? I wasn't paying that much attention. And it says, violators will be prosecuted. And I said, yeah, I guess so. Well, she freaks out. She's like, Dad, isn't that what they did to Jesus? I said, what, what, what do you mean? Isn't that what they did to Jesus? I'm like, no, 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 that was, that was crucified. Crucified. This is, this is prosecuted. She's like, oh, right, right, right. Crucified, not prosecuted. Granted, that would cut down on parking issues if that was the case. But definitions matter. I think you would agree. We're, we're spending seven weeks talking about the, the definition of this word love because this word love is at the center of the Christian life. It's at the center of who God is, the center of the kind of people God wants us to be. So God doesn't want us to have any confusion about it, which is why he gave us these verses in 1 Corinthians 13. So look with me now, 1 Corinthians 13 beginning in verse 4. It says, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. So here in our fourth week, we're going to look at that final phrase there in the middle of verse 5. It does not insist on its own way. Other translations say it this way. The New Living Translation says, it does not demand its own way. NIV says, it is not self-seeking. As has been our pattern in this series, I'm going to do three major sections this morning. The first section is that the Bible tells us God is love. Well, if God is love, therefore God is not selfish. Second part is that God commands us, most important commandment in the Bible is to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Well, if we're supposed to love God, that means that we are not to be selfish in our relationship with God. We are not to insist on our own way in our relationship with him. And then Jesus says the second commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. So if God calls us to love the people around us, then we're called to not be selfish, to not insist on our own way with the people that God has put in our lives. So let's, let's dive in. First part, God is love. Therefore, God is not selfish. Now, right out of the gates here, we find what appears to be a bit of a theological paradox. So you're saying, okay, Rob, God is not love, or God is love, uh, therefore he's not selfish. God doesn't insist on his own way. Well, well what about all this only for the glory of God stuff? 
If you've been around church, you've probably heard God made us to glorify him. God made us to praise him. Well, that all sounds a little selfish, doesn't it? Well, a few thoughts on this. First, we're always tempted to think of God like a human person. Last week, if you were here, uh, we were talking about how some people think that before God made the world, he was lonely. So he's all alone, so he needs to make little friends, little people to play with. Well, that's not true. God wasn't lonely. He was perfectly content and happy all by himself before creation. But you see, we think, well, if I was alone, I would be lonely. We, we extrapolate human experience onto God. But, but he's in a, an entirely different category than us. He is wholly other, beyond space, beyond time, beyond matter, and in, in many ways, beyond our comprehension. And I hope you're thankful for that. If God could fit completely into this space right here, he would not be much of a God. I don't want a God like that. I hope you don't either. So just like we project loneliness onto God, we also project selfishness onto him. Well, if if I wanted to have children just so they would worship me, wouldn't that be selfish? You see, that's taking human experience and slapping it on to God. Let me give you a couple other ways to think about this. Glory, honor, worship, and praise by necessity rise to the top. Let's say that your favorite team wins the championship. They all are on stage after the great victory with the trophy there in the middle, and the players come out, and if they're classy players, what they say is, hey, we just want to thank our coaches. We want to just thank our coaches for getting here. Then the coach comes up, and he says, I want to just thank our owner, the the guy who hired us and the guy who paid all the bills and made all this happen. You see what they're doing? They just keep passing glory up the food chain. Now, the super classy owners then come out and say, hey, I want to thank the players. They're the ones who scored the touchdowns or made the points or whatever. So you see, if glory and praise by necessity rise to the top, who is God supposed to glorify? Who is God supposed to give praise to? Himself. And rightly so. There's no other place to pass it, and it's not selfish. Psalm 19.1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The created, by necessity, praise and glorify the Creator. And it's not selfish. It's not selfish. Let me try this another way. If God were selfless, we say, well, I, I think God should be selfless. Okay, if God were selfless, the opposite of selfish, he would want joy for others. Fair statement? He would want joy for us. He would want happiness for us. Fine. Well, what creates happiness and joy in this life and in eternal life? The answer is that that happiness and joy for us are found in loving and serving and worshiping God forever. So if God was all about your happiness, if God's only concern was your happiness, what would he tell you to do? Love me, serve me, worship me, because that's where you're going to find happiness. That's where you're going to find joy and fulfillment and contentment now and forever. These are not commands of control and domination. They're invitations to happiness and joy. They're invitations to becoming the man or the woman that God created you to be. Now, finally on this, if God were selfish, he would not have made a way for us to be forgiven of our sins. He wouldn't have sent his son to take our sin upon himself and to suffer and die on the cross. A selfish being doesn't put themselves out for others. A selfish being doesn't sacrifice for others. Yet that's exactly what God did for us. Now our text in 1 Corinthians, it specifically says love does not insist on its own way. We see this love for God, this love from God on display 
through his son Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he's crucified. Look at this scripture from Matthew 26. It says, Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even unto death. Remain here and watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. There may not be a greater moment of loving selflessness in all of history than this moment right here. Jesus, the, the, the Son of God, fully God, fully man. In his humanity, he knows the suffering that's about to come. And he says to his Father, if it's possible, if there's another way, if there's another way to purchase salvation, if there's another way to, to buy forgiveness, Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus not insisting on his own wants in that moment, but submitting those to the will of his Father. Jesus' words to, to his Father are, are, are the perfect words to describe what it means for us to not be selfish with God. Let, let, let's talk about that. God calls us to love him, therefore God calls us to not be selfish in our relationship with him, to not like insist on our own way in our relationship with him. So loving God means doing his will, not my will, following his plan, not my plan, believing his words more than my words. If we come to God, and sometimes we do this, if we come to God with the attitude, God, what are you going to do for me? How are you going to bless me? When are you going to fix all my problems? We're coming to God with an unloving, selfish attitude. Jesus said it this way in Luke 9, 23. He said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. This is the call of the Christian life. Come and die. Great PR. Die to yourself. Follow in the footsteps of your master. Become a servant of God. Now why does God call us to die to ourselves? Why does Jesus say, take up your cross daily and follow him? This is not some call to self-inflicted misery. This is not some uh, bizarre asceticism that, that you're trying to intentionally make yourself suffer to earn like spiritual points with God or something. He calls us to die to ourselves because unless we die to ourselves, we can't live for him. The Christian life is not, it's not this idea that, that you start with you, and you're a pretty good person and all, but, but you need a little Jesus to get you over the top, right? You're 90% there, you're doing great, but you can't quite make it, so trust in Jesus and he'll give you an extra 11% and bingo, there you are at 101 or whatever it is. Jesus didn't die on the cross and rise again from the dead to give you a spiritual boost, Think of it this way. There's, you're going to buy an old house. There's two kinds of old houses that you can buy. One kind of old house that you can buy is the fixer-upper. All right? It's inside. The core is good, but the outside's just in shambles. And with a little love and, and uh, care, imagine what it could be. That's the fixer-upper. And then there are tear-downs. You just got to get all that gone. Rip it down, pull it all out, and haul it away and build something new. Friends, we don't need to be fixed up. We need to be torn down. 
God wants to make something new out of you. You remember what Jesus said? He wants you to be born again. The Apostle Paul said it this way in Galatians 2.20. He said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus said it this way in Luke 9, 24. Whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Jesus is talking about two kinds of people here. The first kind of person is selfish. They are concerned about their life, their wants, their plans. And Jesus says the person who is obsessed with their life and their wants and their plans, what's going to happen to their life? What's he say? They're going to lose it. But the person who wants, who is, as we talk about, is Christ-centered, they're concerned about his wants, his will, his glory. What's going to happen to that person's life? They're going to find it. They're going to find it here in this world and in the world to come. Well, I hope this message has been an encouragement for you today. You know, if you're looking for more training and equipping on helping your kids follow Jesus, building more love in your home, we'd encourage you to get a copy uh, of our book, mine and Amy's book, Visionary Parenting. You can find it wherever you buy your books or our online store at visionaryfam.com. Would also love it if this podcast uh, is making a difference in your life. Take a minute right now and maybe even share this episode with a friend or leave a review online. You know, when you leave those reviews, basically what it does is it helps more people discover the podcast. It helps us get this message out to more people around the world, to equip families, to strengthen families, to get more faith in families so that we can see God's kingdom advance through the generations. As always, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear your prayer requests. We'd love to hear your thoughts and responses to the podcast. You can email us at podcast at visionaryfam.com. That's podcast at visionaryfam.com. And we look forward to our next time with you on Family Vision. Family Vision.